Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Uh, this morning, we are in our second week of our series entitled um, Jesus of the Prophets, where we are, are looking, trying to, to take a look at the perspective that the prophets had, and we're speaking into the people of Israel as they're looking forward to the arrival of, of a Messiah, of the one who would be their hope, who would be their restoration, but also then simultaneously looking back from this side of the cross and trying to understand and think about how this informs both our, our own understanding of Jesus and, and what he came to do and what he accomplished on our behalf, but then also how we relate to him. How does this inform and shape the nature of what we're doing in the life of the church even now? Um, I, last week we were talking about how oftentimes story in our culture is, is a representation of the things that we long for, things that, that we feel are, are um, that we need and that we would want to see accomplished, those, those things that we hope for. And one of the aspects of that that we see is, is, is in the love stories that we tell. Like, if you think about what is, the, what is the greatest love story of all time? Any thoughts? What? Romeo and Juliet? That one ends badly, right? Like, yeah. I, well, I was thinking about, like, it was about a year ago at this time, right, that, that uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle got married. And is that right, Markle, Meghan? Prince Harry's wife, um, got married. And, and did you notice just the overall fascination that, that went around that? Like just a show of hands, how many of you got up and watched some of that ceremony? Okay, and the rest of you are lying, I know. <laughs> I even, I caught a little bit of it, like it just, there was just this amazement and the whole spectacle of it. Um, and there's something about this, this prince and princess story that just, captures us, that's fascinating to us, and, and the, whole, the whole pomp and circumstance around it um, is, is engrossing. Or maybe you are one of those literature people, right? right? Like Romeo and Juliet. Maybe you think of the greatest love story ever of these two star-crossed lovers who just can't seem to work things out with their families, and like I said, it doesn't, doesn't end that well, really. Uh, maybe for you, it comes in cinema. Right? Maybe like you think, I, my dad was this huge like um, old movie nerd and so we were always watching like Turner Classic movies or AMC. I've seen more black and white movies than you can possibly imagine, but the classic Casablanca, right? Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Berman, like this sacrificial love and all these like classic one-liners that Bogart has in that movie as he acts on, on her behalf, even though that doesn't mean for him that, that she'll end up with, with him. Or maybe it's just any Nicholas Spark book, right? Any Nicholas Spark movie, notebook, it's old people in love, reading stuff to each other, right? <laughs> you see, I th once again, we, we tell these stories, these, these resonate with us collectively because they reveal something about us. We, we all want to believe in a love that overcomes. We, we want to believe in a love that pursues against all odds, even when it costs you everything. We want, to, we want to believe it's possible, and more than that, we want to experience it. Now, again, these prophets are, are, are speaking, they're looking forward, and they're, they're talking to the people of Israel about the hope of the Messiah and then helping them understand what that's going to look like. And their efforts to do this, the prophets, when they're speaking to the people of Israel, oftentimes they would use a variety of different metaphors to, to help them picture it. So this is some 700, 800 years prior to the arrival of Jesus when people like Isaiah and others are, are talking about who this Savior will be. And so in order for them to understand it, they would use these metaphors like Micah did last week when he talked about how the Messiah would be the, the return of the king, the ancient and 
future king and how this king is also then going to be a shepherd. He, he is our shepherding king. So there's all this imagery of this, this one who is gathering us in under his care and his protection. But this is also our, our king and he's helping them understand who Jesus would be for them. All throughout scripture, we see these metaphors. Sometimes it's, it's, it's the relationship of a father to a child. The, the caring and nurturing and self-sacrificial nature of a relationship of a parent caring for and loving their child. Sometimes it's depicted as adoption, as, as you and I and the people of Israel receiving all the benefits and all the aspects of of sonship and daughtership and having that applied to us. But one of the most common metaphors that we see throughout the prophets to describe to the people of Israel who their Messiah would be is that of a marriage. In fact, marriage is oftentimes used to define how we relate to God in general. It's the relationship between the bridegroom, Jesus, and his beloved bride, the people of Israel, and then later the church, us. Prophets like Ezekiel and and Jeremiah and Isaiah all use this imagery as they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. But the prophet that we are going to look at today, the prophet Hosea, lived this metaphor. In doing so, he, he, he provides for us this powerful depiction, display of God's incredible love for his people. And we understand that that's what he, how he feels, how he acts towards us. I think it's always important to note, and I was thinking about this this week, anytime that we use an illustration or a metaphor such as marriage, and the same is actually true when we talk of of God being like a father to us, our own experiences of that, of marriage, whether they be positive or negative have a tendency to color our understanding of this metaphor that gets used in scripture. Whether that's the marriage that you grew up watching from your parents, whether that's your own experience with marriage, they, they have a tendency to shape how we understand what this looks like. But, but and this is, this is personal for Hosea, as we're gonna see. But, but the point that Hosea wants to make to us is that that Jesus will be for us, Christ will come to be for us the true and perfect bridegroom. And so let's take a look at at what this means. Jesus uses this metaphor himself. This is from Matthew chapter nine. If you flip over there, Jesus is asked, being asked some questions. And in Matthew chapter nine, verses 14 and 15, he responds this way. He says, then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answers, and how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Now, these words by Jesus may not sound that audacious to us, but, but in the mind of a first century Jewish man or woman, someone who grew up hearing the prophets, read, learning from them, even memorizing the words of the prophets, Jesus identifying himself as the bridegroom was bold. Like it had gravity behind it. Because there is a direct correlation to what they knew the prophets said we were looking forward to. There was a direct correlation to the hope that they said the prophets said would come. And Jesus is essentially saying then to the people hearing this, hey, your waiting is over. The the, the bridegroom is here. He's with us. I am him. Now let's turn over to the Old Testament prophet Hosea. We're going to spend most of our time here this morning, and we want to look at at why this imagery carried so much significance and why Jesus chose to use this as as his own expression or correlation or connection to who he was as the Messiah, as the Savior. This is from Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Barry, 
using uh, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reigns of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. And when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. And so he married Gomer, daughter of Dilbum, and she conceived and bore him a son. So the, the, the book of Hosea doesn't waste any time. It gets right into this, this illustration, this metaphor, and at the very outset of the book, what we discover here is an unrequited love, an unrequited love. I, uh, I was, a, I think, a sophomore in high school. It was one of those times when you're hanging out with your buddies, and, and I was um, at my friend's house, and we started kind of, as guys did in high school, you started sharing information about maybe who you had a little bit of interest in, and and what if you were like gonna act on it. And so if you've been a high school guy before, you know that these things have a tendency to spiral, right? Like, so, yeah, you should ask her out and, and all that sort of thing. So I'm talking, I'm telling my friend, well, there's this new girl, Libby, she's, she's um, in my English class and I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of interested. And, and he's like, yeah, you should call her, call her. So I, I fell for it, you know, and I'm in, I'm in my friend's basement. This is before cell phones. So like I got the, the line with the super long cord on it and I'm, I call her up and she answers the phone and, and I'm just like, hey, Libby, it's Sterling and, and um, I'm in your English class. And I just say, hey, I don't know if you are up for it, but maybe next weekend we could go grab dinner or do something like that. I'm, this was, that was probably far more effective than what it actually was like on the phone. And without hesitation, no pause, she just says, no thanks. Like, I, I can never remember the like, no, no sort of like letting me down easy, no like, oh, I've got plans next week. And in fact, just at this time, my friend's older brother comes wandering through and watches this whole scene unfold and just looks at me and goes, that was harsh. Like, she, she didn't even make an excuse. Unrequited love is that, that love that you have, that one-sided, unreturned, unwanted love by the recipient of that love. See, imagine for a moment being Hosea. I told you last week, if God showed up to you and called you to be one of his prophets during this time in, in, the, in the history of the people of Israel, it was, it was a difficult ask of God, of you. It, it meant your life was, was going to be notably uncomfortable at times. And, and Hosea, this is next level stuff for him. Like the next time you feel like God is asking something difficult from you, just, just remember your brother Hosea, all right? Because he is essentially instructing him. He says, I, I want you, Hosea, to experience firsthand the, the heartbreak, the pain, the betrayal, the unfaithfulness of this relationship so that you can accurately depict to the people of Israel what they've done. You, so that you can speak to them with power and, and potency about, about what they've done with my love towards them. So Hosea is instructed then to marry this woman by the name of Gomer. And it does not go well. Um, Gomer is, it's unclear in, from the Hebrew text if, if Gomer was sleeping around prior to her marriage with Hosea or if this just began after their marriage. But what we see very clearly from the beginning is that, that she was unfaithful. In fact, if you look down through chapter one, you discover by the time, so they, they have three children, and, and God instructs Hosea to name the children all these, these very poignant names so that the people of Israel will understand, like their daughter, the second child, I think is named Not Loved. Like that's, that's her name. And by the time they have their son, the, third, the second son, the third child, his name literally in Hebrew translates to Not Mine. Like that's a tough one to go to elementary school with, right? Like, think about what, what is unfolding here. Gomer, this relationship is, is, is falling apart all around him. She is 
perpetually unfaithful. Their marriage is disintegrating. And ultimately, so does her life, both of their lives. She, she has forsaken the love of her husband and chases after these other relationships, which leaves her in this state of desperation. Her, her unfaithfulness ultimately descends into prostitution and, and eventually we find Gomer abandoned and, and really almost being trafficked, probably, is, is where we find her later in the story and we'll come back to that. So then God is, is going to use Hosea's marriage as this depiction of his relationship with Israel. He says, like Hosea, God has, he's made a covenant relationship with the people of Israel, a marriage. They would be, he would be their God and they would be his people, but they too have been unfaithful. God and the people of Israel were tended to be in this exclusive faithful relationship. And yet when they settled into the promised land, the people of Israel began to take all of this abundance and all of God's provision. And they began to take it and lay it at the feet of this pagan Canaanite God named Baal. And God says, this, this idolatry that you are, are a part of, this is spiritual adultery. And God is exposing their sin and the condition of their heart. Now, at this point in the story, it's important to understand God, by every right, could have just broken relationship with the people of Israel. They have not been faithful in this covenant relationship. And yet, just in the point, once again, where things to be, seem to be so hopeless, beyond recovery, God speaks and says, but but I am faithful and I will restore my people back into a relationship with me. Once again, God speaks in hope. If you look over in chapter two, Hosea so poetically describes this. This is uh, verses 19 and 20. So there's all these verses, this, this messaging of, of, of brokenness and despair and broken relationship. And then God says this, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion, and I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Once again, God moves. This is this unrequited love. It's his love, his compassion, his faithfulness that remains true, even when ours doesn't. The Apostle John says it like this in 1 John chapter 4. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave us his son, sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's an unrequited love. It's his compassion, his mercy, his grace, his love for us. And this unrequited love then is also a pursuing love. It's a pursuing love. Again, I think that one of the examples that comes to mind for me when I think about this is, is from cinema, and, um, and many of you I know probably have seen the movie Forrest Gump. Anybody, everybody seen that over the years? A lot of us have, and, and that's a classic one. But what that movie, as you watch the life of Forrest progress throughout its history, right, alongside of that is his pursuit of, his love for his childhood sweetheart, Jenny. And you see, it's, it's throughout the movie, it is also an unrequited and unequal, unreturned love. And yet there's this nonstop journey that Forrest is on for her to understand and know and experience his love for her. And it's, it's this kind of heartwarming yet heartbreaking pursuit that we see unfold throughout the course of, of the movie. So flip over now to Hosea chapter 3. So after all of this poetry about God's, about, about, about the, the judgment that's going to come as a result of unfaithfulness, and yet God saying, but I won't leave you there. I will stay faithful. This is what God says to Hosea. This is verse one. He says, the Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again. And though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. 
though they have turned to other gods in the love of sacred raisin cakes. So that raisin cake thing there at the end, um, I was curious about that. And that is a, a, uh, uh, a food that was oftentimes used during idol worship in, of, of Baal. And so he's saying, you've, you've turned to this other way, but Jose, I want you to go find, I want you to go find Gomer and I want you to, to pursue her. See, this is the nature of God's love being depicted in front of us. God tells Hosea, go and find your wife, chase after her, pursue her. Likely, at this point in time in the story, Hosea might have no idea where she's at. Hosea would have been absolutely justified, just as God is, if he said to her, hey, look, you know where I'm at. You come and find me. Or even saying to her, like, I don't want to be a part of this. But that isn't what happened. In fact, it's at this point of the story that, that Gomer in her own power can't return. She doesn't have the ability. And this is what resonates so powerfully with God's love. It's a love that pursues. It's a love that overcomes every obstacle. It finds us in the midst of our brokenness, even our own rejection at times, in order to meet us in the place of our greatest need. See, what I, what I find so compelling about this marriage metaphor that God is unfolding here in the depiction or the description of God's love for us is, is what it reveals about who God is. You see, most of you know me. You, what you know about me is what you see in this context in general. I, I, I try to give you a version of myself that is at least somewhat accurate, and yet th th there's always other levels, right? Some of you are, 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 have served with me in ministry for years. Some of you are a part of small groups that I have been in. So you have like a, a deeper level understanding. You've seen some things at times that, that are the uglier side of who I am. You've seen me when I'm not in my best moments. I'm not standing up here and and teaching when I'm overtired or I've said something stupid or I've hurt somebody in some way. Some of you have had a first, uh, a first row seat to that, right? Some of you are, are dear friends that have done life with me for years. And you even a, a, a deeper picture into who I am and, and what my character is. And you, you've loved me in the midst of that in my best moments and my worst. But none of you have the sort of understanding or awareness of who I am that my wife has. None, none of you have seen the things that, that she has seen. None of you have seen me in the moments that she has seen me in. And, and, and yet the beauty of that relationship is that Cherry chooses to love me despite that knowledge. She, she chooses, she doesn't always like me, but she chooses to love me despite the awareness and the knowledge of, of the darkest sides of my character that she sees. And see, this is, what, this is what we're beginning to wrap our heads around with what Hosea is teaching us about who God is and the way that he views us and understands us. When I was working on this this week, I, one of the things that stood out to me is, is just the nature of what sin is. As, as sort of like spiritual idolatry. And I have this tendency to kind of, I can be trite about how that impacts or affects my relationship with God as if God's just kind of standing up there being like, Sterling, come on. Like we've, we've talked about this. Like, let's, let's take that next step. Let's get over this, you know, buddy. Like Hosea, Hosea paints this picture and, and I forget this, that, that my sin, when it, when spiritual, it's all sin is a form of spiritual idolatry in some parts. Me choosing to, to believe the lie that something else is going to provide something that, that only God is. And so I put that first. And when I do that, I'm just, I'm just raking his love for me through the mud. Like I, I, I grieved it this week when I, when I was reading this and understanding like, wow, that is the gravity of this. But this is also the beauty of this. That despite all of that, despite that, and here's the thing about God, it's not that he has the most knowledge about me, is that he has full knowledge about me. Even the things that, that Sherry doesn't know, 
the, the things that, that I keep in the de deepest, darkest parts of my heart, God is fully aware of that, and in spite of that, he pursues. In spite of that, he, he, he shows his love in the midst of my brokenness. It's who he is. Listen again to how Hosea describes this as it relates to, to God's pursuit of his people, Israel. This is back in chapter 2, verses 14 uh, through 16. He says, Therefore I am now going to allure her, and I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her, and there I will give her back her vineyards, and will make the valley of Anchor a door of hope. And she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came out of Egypt. And in that day declares the Lord, You will call, you will call me my husband, and you will no longer call me my master. There's this beautiful picture of the pursuing love. And lastly, we discover then God's love is a redeeming love. It is a redeeming love. Again, back in chapter 3, God instructs Hosea. He says, I want you to go after her. I want you to pursue her. And this is what unfolds. He says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lecti of barley. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days, and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. So we don't, we don't have all the details about what's unfolded from chapter 1 to chapter 3, but what we discover here is that Hosea is, is in a place where she is, is literally being sold. Whether this is a result of, of some debt that she has, or this is she is being trafficked, likely the latter. This is also an indication, by the way, of, of where things are at in Israel right now. That, that, th that this sort of thing is happening is just an indication of how far they've come from what God created them to be. Humans are being moved as, as property. Imagine Gomer for a minute, standing in that place, Likely in, in a situation where um, she is fully exposed to the world around her. Hearing different people bid on you. With the only defense that you have to be to close your eyes and just try to get through it. And in the midst of that, your, your husband's voice, you hear it in the distance, begins to bid begins to say 10 shekels, 12, I'll do 15, I'll do a homer and a lecti of, of barley. And, and he buys her back out of whatever situation she's found and he redeems her into this marriage relationship that they have with each other. James Boyce, who's a, a pastor in, in New York City, he did a sermon series on the book of Hosea that he later turned into a book. And when he's writing about Hosea and he gets to chapter three, the title of that chapter is called the greatest chapter in the Bible. Because it's just this beautiful picture of what God does. And then God says, Israel, people of Israel, this is what, this is what I want to do for you. This is what I've come to do for you. Verse four and five says, for the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince without sacrifice or sacred stone, without ephod or, or household gods. And so he's saying there, there, there's going to be distance and consequence and brokenness as a result of the unfaithfulness. But afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and into the blessings of his last days. God is going to buy you back. And he is going to accomplish this through the one who will be a king in the line of David. Jesus is God's pursuing and his redeeming love. In Romans chapter 5, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for, for us. In Jesus Christ, God enters our world, he pursues us, and he pays the penalty for our sin. And then, and then he wraps around us, he clothes us with his perfection. He pursues us in order to redeem us. When Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom in Matthew chapter 9, he, 
He's referring to himself as the one who sought out his bride despite her unfaithfulness. As, as the one who found her in total brokenness and despair. As the one who sacrificed himself in order to redeem her. As the one who, who cares for her and covers her, her exposure in order to protect with his righteousness. He's the one who brings her into his home, into his family, to become his treasured love and his precious bride. See, this is what Christ has done for us. This is what he is for you. This is how much God loves you. At the very conclusion of Hosea, in chapter 14, verse 9, this is the last verse of the book. Hosea writes this, he says, Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. See, Hosea is saying that this is not just an ancient story. It's not locked in the past, but it's our story. This Hebrew poetry reveals to us the, the nature of our own hearts and souls, and it reveals to us the redeeming love of our God. And he wants us to understand, this is how I love you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to gather together in community and to look again at this incredible love that you, that you put on display for us by sending the one who would pursue in order to redeem. May we know that love and live in that relationship with you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.